uh, any questions from the previous class? Okay. So in the last class, I introduced this notion of a kernel. Uh, essentially, any function that takes two inputs and outputs a real number is called a kernel. Uh, but but what we're interested in are positive definite symmetric kernels, which are those uh, for which the gram matrix or the kernel matrix is is always symmetric and positive symmetric right um, and and the reason why we are interested in pds kernels is as we'll show later today uh, if you if you take a kernel on any input space then the kernel looks like an inner product in some higher dimensional space right it's as though you're mapping the inputs from the domain into a higher dimensional feature space, into some feature space. And, uh, and the kernel works as the inner product in this feature space. So instead of working on inner pro or instead of working in the feature space, instead of designing the classifier in the feature space, uh, as we'll see, all you need to do is just uh, play tricks and you can work with just the kernel itself. Okay, so uh, we saw a few examples of kernels in the last class and also some properties, some basic properties of kernels or uh, essentially preservation properties. Uh, if, if f is a function from the domain to the set of reals, then any kernel of the, or any function of the form f of x times f of x prime is a PDS kernel. And if you have two uh, or if you have pds kernels then you can form a new pds kernel by taking any uh, non negative linear combination of these kernels or taking the product of pds kernels or essentially any series consisting of uh, so so this the linear combination need not even be a finite linear combination as long as you have a convergent series uh, it turns out that that also gives you a pds kernel right there's another property of kernels that is useful. And again, I, I leave this as an exercise. So if you take a kernel and normalize it the following way. So if K is a PDS kernel, then the following normalized version, let me call this k bar, so k bar of x1, x2 is k of x1, comma x2 divided by square root of k of x1, comma x1 times k of x2 comma x2 this is also pds all right again i have to be a little careful when i say this so i have to make sure that it, this whole this this statement is true if i can't have k of x1 comma x1 or k of x2 comma x2 to be equal to 0 so I need to add an additional condition. If k of x1 comma x1 uh, is non-zero, k of x2 comma x2 is non-zero. So if either of k of x1 comma x1 or x2 or k of x2 comma x2 is equal to zero, then this k bar is also equal to zero. That's that's the definition. That that's uh, how I define this k bar, and it turns out that this is also a PDS term. The nice feature about this. Um, is it's in some sense normalized right so k of x comma x is always equal to one right. 
which one so k of x1 comma x1 as it will be a norm but this in some sense is normalized right make sure that uh yeah loosely speaking it's like you're looking at unit norm vector. So another property uh, of kernels is again straightforward something that we have seen uh, briefly in the previous class. So if k is PDS then it satisfies a cauchy schwarz inequality that is k of x1 x2 is always less than or equal to square root of k of x1 x1 times k of x2 comma x2 right do you recall how we showed this You simply consider the following Gram matrix, which is k of x1, x1, k of x1, x2, k of x2, x1, which is just k of x1, x2, k of x2, x2. We know that this Gram matrix is uh, PSD. So, what can you say about the determinant greater than or equal to 0? Uh, and the determinant is simply k of x1, x2 minus uh, times k of x2, sorry, k of x1, x1 times k of x2, x2 minus k of x1, x2 the whole square. No, right? I have not proved that. So, if k of x1, x2 is the inner product between x1 and x2, then fine. Yeah, it satisfies the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. We want to do it, but it doesn't mean that if I take an arbitrary. So, what we have seen so far is that an inner product is a valid PDS kernel, right? I have not proved that. If I take an arbitrary PDS kernel, then it corresponds to an inner product in some space, right? For instance, um, what I mean, so yeah. So if I take the Gaussian kernel or the mis or the sequence mismatch kernel or or the polynomial kernel, I I don't know if that still satisfies the cauchy schwarz inequality. Um, because it's a function of the inner product, right? Why does it have to satisfy the Cauchy Schwarz inequality? No, right? I can't take an arbitrary function of the inner product and claim that it satisfies and that and say that that behaves like an inner product, right? So, in fact, our goal is to prove that k of x1, x2 behaves like an inner product, right? Um, again, it doesn't behave like an inner product over the space where x1 and x2 lie in. It behaves like an inner product in some other space. So, in order to do that, let's, uh, let's look at the following. So, we need the minimal structure in order to define an inner product, right? and that structure that, that we will require is, and the structure that these kernels uh, will, uh, will operate on are Hilbert spaces. So, what is a Hilbert space? It will be a little more precise. So, 
uh, a Hilbert space is essentially a complete vector space We'll denote the Hilbert space by H uh, with an inner product. So let's let's break it down. What is a complete space? So all Cauchy sequences converge, right? So this means that as long as I have a Cauchy sequence in H, it converges to some point in H. Right? Um, but over, over this, I also need a norm, sorry, an inner product. It has to satisfy the following properties. So the inner product is has to be symmetric. If I take two element, the inner product of any two elements f and g, then this is also equal to the inner product between g and f. I want this to be linear in one of the arguments, either of the arguments, alpha f1 plus beta f2, with g is equal to alpha times inner product between f1 and g plus beta times the inner product between f2 and g. Now the inner product between an element f with itself is always greater than or equal to 0 with equality if and only if f is the zero vector right um so the, the hilbert space in principle it could be a finite dimensional vector spaces a, a euclidean space with the standard inner product uh, but it could also be say a function space for example uh, the set of all functions that can be written in terms of a Taylor series expansion with an inner product which is integral um, between uh, of f, f times g dx. Right? So as long as I have a vector space that is complete and an inner product uh, that is a function on, on pairs of elements that satisfy all of these properties, it forms a Hilbert space. Okay. And, and in fact, as we'll see, we'll mostly be interested in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, not finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. <clears throat> So here's the main result that I want to prove in this particular class. Uh, it says the following. So So suppose I have an arbitrary PDS kernel. then there exists some Hilbert space and 
and a mapping p from x to this Hilbert space such that the inner product between any two elements p of x1 and p of x2 this is equal to k of x1 x2 This Hilbert space has some other nice properties. Um, and another thing to keep in mind is that this Hilbert space is not unique. There could be multiple, so for a given kernel, there could be multiple Hilbert spaces and, uh, uh, and with, with corresponding phi such that uh, the inner product within that Hilbert space is equal to the evaluation of the kernel on these two vectors. But we look at a special kind of a Hilbert space, which is called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So I'm not defining a phi, right? The only thing that is given to you is a PDS kernel. I'm saying that as long as I have a kernel, a PDS kernel K, there is some Hilbert space and there is some mapping from x to the Hilbert space such that the inner product within this Hilbert space corresponds to evaluation of the kernel. I'm not constructing k using phi. I'm not giving you a phi. I'm saying that as long as I give your, you give me a k that is PDS, there is a corresponding phi and there is a Hilbert space h. I'm sorry. Correct. And of course, the, this mapping may, so the mapping may not be unique. If I don't care about what Hilbert space this is, for a given H, it will be not necessarily right. Um, but again, there exists a H and there exists a corresponding phi. Right? Um, it doesn't mean that for every Hilbert space I can find a mapping from K to H, right? It will be, um, need not be in general. I don't care, right? I don't want to go back to X. Why do I want to go back to X? Right. My my end goal is to design a learning algorithm. It could either be classification or regression or something else. Right. Um, essentially, what I want is a tool so that or a mapping such that given. Uh, so I need to be the end goal is to be able to design a rich enough hypothesis class over which I can that which I can learn very easily. In other words, I should be able to learn this hypothesis class using techniques for linear classification or linear regression or linear algorithms. Um, so even though the, this, uh, the Hilbert space, the corresponding Hilbert space and phi is not unique, uh, there is a special Hilbert space called the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, which is unique, which will turn out to be unique for a given k. All right.
So the specific uh, map that I look at uh, is the following. So the map phi. So I'll, I'll, I'll start out by constructing the phi. And this phi will be a map from the from the domain to R power x. So for every phi, so, so for every x, I essentially get a function on x. No, so x could be infinite. It's more, more interesting when x is infinite. So r power x means the set of all functions on x set of all real valued functions on x right uh, so so for instance if x is let us say the interval from 0 to 1 then r to the power x is the set of all functions are defined on the interval 0 to 1 okay so i'll define p subscript x So this is the corresponding function uh, and the function is defined in the following way p x for given x prime is k of x comma x prime. So phi x is essentially the function k of x. Where the second variable can be taken arbitrarily from the set x. Um, so for a given x, px is a function. corresponds to that particular point x it's it's a function so remember that k is a function of two variables right so p x is a function of one variable and it's equal to k of x comma second variable is free correct correct and that is my I can have A instead of um, maybe I didn't follow that theory. Okay. Correct. Yes. No, 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 k is fixed, right? We're fixing the kernel. Um, so, let's see. So, p x1 would be k x1, comma, so the second variable is free, right? p x2 would be k of x2 this right so for example let's take a specific let's take maybe the specific example of a polynomial kernel okay let's take all right let's take the example of a polynomial kernel let's say k of x1 x2 is um say 1 plus x1 x2 square okay so in this case v essentially maps x or x1 to the function 1 plus x1 x the whole square so this is now a function of 
x right so this is my what i call p x1 of x a fixed x1 okay so so really there are two variables here right there is x1 and there is x2 so x1 is mapped to a function right and that function is a variable of the second argument of k that's it right so for example whatever phi 1 of x so 1 let's say the element 1 is mapped to phi 1 of x which is 1 plus x square 2 is mapped to 1 plus 2x the whole square and so on right um, so so this so each of these is a function on r And that is my Hilbert space that I am going to work with. It's a collection of functions, a collection of real valued functions. Um, yeah, because you can view it as a parametric function, and that parameter is this particular. So I, I've taken the parameter equal to one to get this particular function if i take a parameter value equal to 2 then it's 1 plus 2x the whole square right so you can view this phi x1 as a parametric function where the parameter value is equal to x1 or equal to x2 yeah right so for this specific example of polynomial curve right? okay so that's how I'm defining px, right? And I mean that's that's right now a map, but I haven't really defined what the space is yet. It's not the space of all possible functions. That's too rich a space. So I look at a smaller class of functions. First, I'll define this h zero to be the set of all finite linear combinations of p x i s okay so it is the set of all functions f which can be written as summation i in some finite index set of alpha i p of p x i This is just summation i in i alpha i k of x i comma whatever. So f of x is going to be the x i of x. Right? This is how you should view this. is this okay is the definition okay all right so first is h0 a vector space And why? What properties? It has a zero vector. But they're not linear properties. 
basically all you need to verify is that it's closed under linear combinations finite linear combinations and by definition it is closed under finite linear combinations right and the thing to keep in mind that is that h0 is a subset of a larger vector space which is the space of all possible functions on uh, r uh, uh, sorry on x right okay so this h0 is a vector space and that is fine uh, but but what i need to now show is that it's an you know it's it's actually a hilbert space so i need to prove so firstly i have to define an inner product right and secondly i have to show that it is also complete okay so um, so in fact we'll see that h0 is not necessarily complete i need an extra step to transform h0 or in other words add more points to h0 in order to make it complete but we'll still see that h0 is an in, is a valid inner product space so i'll define the inner product between two elements so let's say for f suppose my f is summation i in some finite index set i of alpha i p x i this is one function and g is say j in some other finite index set j beta j p x j then the inner product is well it's natural i need to introduce the kernel at this particular point so it's simply going to be summation i in i summation j in j uh, alpha i beta j k of x i x j So essentially, what is the intuition behind choosing this particular inner product? If I take just phi x i and phi x j, right, which is essentially the feature of x i and feature of x j, I want the inner product between these two to be k of x i x j. That's my end goal, right? Because that's how I wanted to define, wanted the kernel to satisfy. Now, if I take any linear combination of these vectors, then the inner product, if, if the, I have to define an inner product for a linear combination of these vectors, then it had better be just a linear combination of their inner, inner products. Right? And that's exactly what I have over here. Right? So, if, if k of xi, xj were actually an inner product between xi and xj, then an inner product between this and this would have to be uh, would, would have to exactly be equal to this so in case, so if i had so the natural inner product would be summation i in i j in j alpha i beta j inner product between p x i and p x j all right that's just by linearity correct and i'm, I'm essentially defining this inner product to be k of x i comma x j Is this okay? Um, K is a mapping from X, X cross X to R. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, what, what is this? Okay. 
the natural changes in mind and energy production in the two different. Correct. But we are expected to find it as k of x i. Correct. So okay. So so I'm defining a function. Right. I have to prove that this function is a valid inner product. Right. So the second expression is if it were actually an inner product, yeah, if the above expression were inner product, then this would be equal to this, correct? So I'm just trying to build intuition. Right? I'm saying that k of xi xj behaves like an inner product on uh, phi xi and phi xj. So I'm defining this using just phi xi and phi xj, right? Nothing else. But I need to expand this sort of inner product to the entire space, the entire vector space, right, which contains more than just phi xi and phi xj, it contains all possible linear combination of phi xi's and phi xj's. Okay, at this point, this is just a function. In fact, um, if you want, let me just call this, uh, let's say, f of little f, little g. It's some function at this point. And I still have to prove that this is an actual inner product. Okay. So, so firstly, uh, is f of f g equal to f of g comma f it is just by symmetry of k right um, I, i'm not using the fact that it is psd i'm just using the fact that it is symmetric this is summation a in i a in j alpha i beta j k of x i j which is equal to i just interchange the order of summation What about linearity? So if I have the summation uh, L equal to 1 to uh, M, let's take 2. So A1 F1 plus A2 F2 with G. So what is a what is f1? Let's say that this is summation i in i1 alpha i1 p x i1 and f2 is summation i in i2 alpha i2 p p x
फोर एक्स पी इक्वल टू This is nothing but one, one. B is I one. Uh, times this this is some summation i in i alpha i p x i you could take the union of the index sets but i am just going to separate them out because there could be an overlap this is just summation i in i uh, or summation i in i1 it's a, it's just an element wise product and then you take the sum a1 one summation j in j p1 alpha i1 times a of x i1 j plus j in i2 j in j a2 alpha i2 k of x i2 which is nothing but a1 times if i take this a1 outside the inner product between f1 and g or using the notation f plus a2 times f of f2 comma g straight forward <clears throat> um Okay, um, so that's two properties done. I'm going to prove a third property. Let's look at the inner product between F and itself. This is just summation I in I. Summation J in I alpha I alpha J uh, K of XI XJ. 
correct? Because my F, remember, is summation I in I, alpha I, Dx. Exactly. Right. Uh, since I is a finite set, this is nothing but alpha transpose the graph matrix times alpha. Is greater than or equal to zero. Am I done? Yeah. Okay, that's a we will get to that later. H zero as it turns out is not complete. I have to I have to complete it. Um, but yeah, what's the other step? Yeah. I have to show that it's equal to zero only if f is equal to zero. Right? This point, this is insufficient to conclude that it's equal to zero if uh, if if f is non-zero. Ah, that as it turns out in H, it, all Cauchy sequences don't converge. So I basically need to complete it by adding more vectors. Okay. So that's a separate argument that we'll just throw under the rug. We that you that there are standard ways of completing the space, uh, but but right now I have to prove this other property about the inner about F. Right. Um, so, in order to do this, uh, let me first look at the following vector. So, I, I'm fixing this particular f, and corresponding to this f, I have this gram matrix. Right. So, I'm taking f to be equal to summation i in i. alpha i pxi and for i and j from this index set i i define k i define the gram matrix where the i j entry is k of xi exactly what I have over here okay, so let me consider this gram matrix and now I'll take another x completely different from I mean potentially different from x1 through whatever different from those which lie in this index set i okay something else it could be from i it need not be from So let's take any x from the domain and I'll define the vector c uh, as the following. So it is k of x i comma x i in i. Okay. I'm just defining this vector. I comma J. So so that's so this set I and the alpha I's essentially define f the same thing i can basically represent the phi using this kernel i'm, I'm just taking the kernel or the gram matrix corresponding to this collection of x size that's it 
Which one? This one? This, the vector C. It's a vector. So it's a column vector. Okay. Uh, it's a column vector that depends on X. Of course, it depends on uh, these X size as well. Okay. All right. Um, so here's something. If I take the vector alpha and take the inner product between alpha and C, what do I get? Yeah. So it's summation i in i of alpha i k of x i comma x, which is nothing but f of x. The function f evaluated at x. Let's just keep that in mind. Now, now let me consider a new matrix. Uh, which is the gram matrix if I also included X okay so um, uh, not yet so let me just consider what see what the gram matrix is let me call this K tilde which is the following matrix is K vector C, C transpose K of X comma X. C is a column vector, yes. So, I mean, assuming that, let's say that size of I, without loss of generality, let me just assume that I is equal to 1, 2, 3, up to N. Just, just so that notation becomes convenient. Uh, then this K is an N by N matrix. Okay. This C is an N by 1 matrix. N rows and 1 column. C transpose is a 1 by N matrix. And this is a 1 by 1 matrix. So overall, this is essentially equal to k of x i x j so if 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 my x is let me call this x n plus 1 then this is just the n plus 1 by n plus 1 gram matrix Right. So basically, let, let's let me write it down the following way. Right. So this is just k of x one, x one, k of x one, x n, x n, x one. X n X n right this was the gram matrix corresponding to the x1 through xn that defined f right x1 through xn defined f right and this is the corresponding gram matrix now i'm i'm now introducing a new element xn plus 1 all right and i'm looking at the gram matrix of x1 through xn plus 1. So what would be the gram matrix corresponding to that? x1, uh, xn plus 1 up to a xn, xn plus 1, a xn plus 1, x1, k, uh, x n plus 1 x n 
and I have a final k xn plus 1 xn plus 1 right so basically this block so this block corresponds to the matrix k this vector c uh, so so this sequence of rows corresponds to the vector c similarly this corresponds to c transpose and finally this corresponds to the final right that's it now this is a valid this k tilde is a valid gram matrix so it is also psd So if I take any vector, um, let me call it beta, beta transpose k tilde beta should be greater than or equal to 0. Correct? I will take a special beta. So my beta is going to be the vector alpha along with some other number b okay now if i take this special beta what does beta transpose k tilde beta equal to what so what is again remember beta tilde Sorry, beta transpose this matrix k c c transpose k of x comma x uh, let's write it in terms of alpha and b Um, it's going to be alpha transpose a alpha plus two times alpha transpose uh, uh, c plus uh, this was one of the b plus b square times k x x okay is this okay at this point again let's my goal is to show that i've, I've fixed a particular f right corresponding to this f there is some collection of vectors x1 through again if it makes things easy assume that it's a summation i equal to 1 to n alpha i px i just one second it has to be finite right It has to be finite, I yes, yes. So i, this index set i has to be finite. I'm only looking at finite linear combinations, all possible finite linear combinations of the phi x i's. Yeah. Okay, so I have this x1 through xn. I'm looking at so I'm I'm picking another element not in this particular set, call it X, and I have this bigger gram matrix. 
and I'm just considering beta transpose this bigger gram matrix times beta. Since the bigger gram matrix is PSD, this has to be greater than or equal to zero for all B. Right. Now let us suppose that um, the inner product of F with itself was equal to zero. All right. Or in other words, capital F of F comma F, this is equal to 0. <coughs> okay. But what is that in over here? So this is nothing but, so alpha transpose K alpha is So let's suppose that it's equal to 0. Suppose that this is equal to zero. Right. Um, note that this term doesn't depend on x, the new x that I picked, and x or b. And but this has to hold true for every x and every b. In fact, this also holds true for all x in x. So now suppose that this quantity is equal to 0. And this has to hold true for every b. So first let's fix an x. Suppose this had to hold true for every single B. What does that mean? Yeah? The discriminant of the quadratic. Okay. So. Four alpha transpose C should be. Whole square. I'm sorry. be less than or equal to 4 times um okay sure the 4 gets cancelled so if you look at the discriminant uh this whatever this times this the whole square should be less than or equal to 4 times this times kxx right but what is that equal to 0 so what should alpha transpose c should be equal to should be equal to 0. Alpha transpose C should be equal to 0. But again, recall what is alpha transpose C equal to? F of x, right? Which implies that F of x equal to 0, right? And so if this is true, then f of x should be equal to 0, right? I mean, if this is true and this is equal to 0, then f of x should be equal to 0. But this statement is valid for every x, which means that f of x should be equal to 0 for every x. It means that f is the 0 vector. Right. 
So this last part is a bit unintuitive. Seems like I just pulled it out of nowhere. Um, but whatever, it still lets us prove that um, this space H0 is a valid inner product space. There's a well-defined inner product. And in fact, this is an inner product. The only thing that is now missing is that H0 is not a complete vector space. So I have to complete it by including all possible Cauchy sequences. And that's a standard argument. Again, it's just a technical argument, nothing else. So, so H H by completing H0. A Cauchy sequence is any sequence of elements such that uh, the distance between them decreases, vanishes to zero as as n tends to infinity right so it's any okay. basically it is some f whatever f1 f2 and so on, such that uh, norm whatever f i f j tends to zero as i j. This norm is, I mean, whatever. So this, the inner product defines a norm. So this is the norm over this Hilbert space. Okay. So we've seen that if, um, if if I have a PDS kernel K, then there exists at least one Hilbert space. In fact, you can think of this as sort of a canonical Hilbert space and a canonical mapping phi from X to this Hilbert space. Uh, but as it turns out, this, this particular Hilbert space that we've constructed has some nice properties. Uh, which which are not immediately evident um, i mean the property is evident but uh, that also guarantees some sort of uniqueness so if you have any hilbert space so you look at any hilbert space of functions from some domain to R. Right? So, so this Hilbert space H is some collection of functions from X to R. That could be any arbitrary Hilbert space. Um, we define the, the so-called evaluation functional so Lx of f is simply defined as f of x. This is just a number, right? For a given f and for a given x, this is just a number, f of x. All right? Now this, this is called
it is a functional value. Now, of course, the, the, typically when we think of f of x, you fix f and you vary x. Right? When you are thinking of the evaluation function, uh, evaluation functional, you are fixing a particular x and varying f. Okay. So you can think of this l x for a given x. This l x is a function on this space of functions. Um, you can think of this as parameterized by x once you fix the parameter. This is a function over this Hilbert space h. Okay, it seems like a rather complicated way to think of things, but yeah, just bear with me. I'm sorry? No, 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 nothing of that sort. Nothing of that sort. Right? So, so essentially this Hilbert space is said to be is said to be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. which I'll abbreviate as RKHS. If, if this evaluation, if this evaluation functional is bounded uh, for all X, that is LX of F, the absolute value is less than or equal to some number which could potentially depend on x times the norm of f within this Hilbert space h. Which one? I, I'm defining this to be a reproducing kernel. So any Hilbert space, so if I consider any arbitrary Hilbert space, it is called a reproducing kernel Hilbert space if it satisfies this particular property. Right? Um, and the nice feature about, so, so right now what we've seen is, okay, so one thing is, I mean, it's very sort of easy to verify that um, if you you took a kernel and you defined this h as per what we did in the theorem all right so let me call this It's by completing H to zero. Let me call this H subscript K. Okay, so this is the Hilbert space that I constructed using this particular construction. So it's not difficult to verify, uh, just Cauchy Schwarz that, um, I mean, yeah that H K is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay. Um, so given a kernel, we can construct a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. Okay. Um, we will we'll see what we mean by the reproducing property in a little bit. Just don't worry about the term reproducing, but yeah, 
it's a Hilbert space constructed from a kernel, right? I mean, this was a Hilbert space that I constructed using a kernel. The kernel gives the inner product, right? Uh, but that was a specific construction, right? In the previous theorem, I construct so given k, I constructed a specific Hilbert space, all right? And that happened to satisfy this property. Okay, that's one point. That's the statement that I'm making over here. That HK satisfies this particular property. Right? But now suppose I'm given an arbitrary Hilbert space of functions from X to R. That happens to satisfy this property. A any arbitrary Hilbert space. That, I mean, I didn't explicitly construct it using a specific kernel. Okay. It's any Hilbert space of functions for which this evaluation functional is bounded. That's it. Okay. Then, if uh, some H is... <coughs> then, then in fact we can construct a kernel there exists a kernel x cross x to r um, which is pds and uh, P from X to uh, H such that K of X comma X prime is equal to the inner product between P of X and P of X prime where this inner product is on this whatever is defined by the Hilbert space. And moreover, as it turns out, this is you this for a given k this is unique. So for a given k there exists a unique reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So in other words, when I take So I started out with a kernel, right? I said that there could be multiple Hilbert spaces and mappings to that Hilbert space. There could be multiple Hilbert spaces for which this kx1, x2 behaves like an inner product, right? But the point here is that um, if I also want this, I want it to be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, then there's only one. There's only one reproducing kernel Hilbert space corresponding to this particular key. There are no two ways of constructing reproducing kernel Hilbert space. I'm sorry? Yeah? I'm not going to prove this, but you can look at the lecture notes by Percy Liang for uh, at least a sketch of the proof. It requires a lot more like real analysis to, to prove that, to, to prove uniqueness and so on. Yes, I mean, the H is unique. Yeah. Right. And similarly, for a given reproducing kernel Hilbert space, the corresponding kernel is also unique. So there's a one to one map between these kernels and the reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Again, we won't prove this particular fact. Uh, 
um no so if i want in addition i want this particular property then it's unique if i don't care about this boundedness property then there are multiple ways of doing it no 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 so i could have multiple hilbert spaces for which inner product in that hilbert space is equal to evaluation on the kernel okay but apart from reproducing kernel hilbert space if i take any other hilbert space i could have like multiple other hilbert spaces those hilbert spaces will not satisfy this boundedness of the evaluation function okay it's a it's a slightly technical argument you may question as to why i want this property in the first first place but but this as it as it turns out will give us another property the reproducing property right and if you want that reproducing property then this this mapping between hk and h is unique there are no two reproducing kernel hilbert spaces for a given kernel which one yeah so we we won't explicitly use this particular property but there's another property the reproducing kernel property yes so all of this i mean if you go into this in more detail it's just functional analysis right and that's not really the point of all of this we so there are certain nice properties of these mappings and we just want to see which properties we can use in order to train our svn that that's recall that that's our end goal we know how to train an svm and we want to be able to train a kernel svm efficiently that that's our objective Okay, so let's let's stop here. Any questions? You want to make them linearly separable for the given data set? Sure. If, if that is your only requirement, making them linearly separable, there is always a way, right? You, you choose some trivial mapping. All the points labeled one, you just map them to say plus one. All 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 elements which are labeled zero, you just map them to minus one. The data set now becomes linearly separable, but it's going to have a horrible generalization error. Again, it's again if that was your only requirement then this there are trivial ways of doing it but those trivial ways would give you really bad generalization error right because if you don't choose because there are multiple ways of choosing this mapping if you don't choose it well, you could make it linearly separable. But by well, I mean that you should eventually get a low enough generalization error. Right. That's what. Don't do something bad. Don't do something that is obviously bad. Our goal is not to cons not to make the data linearly separable. Right. Because right now, what do we know? So given a data set, even if it is not linearly separable, I can train SVM using the soft SVM algorithm. That is fine. The problem is I can achieve a generalization error that is close to the best in the class, but my class is not rich enough. So I need to construct a richer class. So I need to construct nonlinear classifiers. But if I choose an arbitrary linear classifier, then I don't know how to do ERM. I, I can't really train it efficiently. So what do I do? I, I, I look at a specific um, 
sort of hypothesis set that is defined using these kernel functions. Right? The nice thing about these kernel functions is that by choosing a different k, I can get a different hypothesis class. But all of these, again, I've not shown you exactly how you can do it, but these can be trained using the soft SVM algorithm efficiently. Right? So if you just again, if you go, if we go back to So this the, the way I defined phi, right? The way I defined phi, what would be the VC dimension of this in general? It would be infinite. The VC dimension would be infinite if if x is an infinite set, right? If x is an infinite set, then this is guaranteed to be an infinite this, this is guaranteed to have infinite VC dimension. So so really, VC dimension is not really useful to us anymore at this point when we're looking at kernel methods. But as it turns out, the Rademacher complexity for these kernel for these kernel methods is is not too large. So recall that when we wanted to prove generalization error bounds, we first bounded the generalization error using the Rademacher complexity and showed that that could be upper bounded by some function of the VC dimension, right? Because the Rademacher complexity is very hard to compute in general, whereas the VC dimension is something that we can compute a little more easily. But the VC dimension doesn't always capture the, comp the, the generalization error as well as uh, the sample complexity all the time. And this is one such example where VC dimension gives you a very weak bound, but the Rademacher complexity is more something much smaller. Okay. okay, let's stop here.